So our first uh, post on the top is uh, complexity of learning and creating smart systems. Yeah, so I'm Robert. I'm very happy to be invited to this workshop. It has been a very fun um, lectures and um, talks. And today I'll be talking about the fundamental relationship between the complexity of learning and the complexity of creating quantum systems. So complexity is a pervasive concept that has been used a lot in computer science to talk about algorithmic efficiency, in information science to talk about communication complexity and so on, as well as in physics. While this is a broad concept and has been used in many different places, it also has various different forms. For example, people in algorithmic information theory talked about Como growth complexity, people in say, um, electrical engineering might talk more about circuit complexity, and people in computer science and machine learning talks more about computational and simple complexity. All of these, uh, despite our, our all complexity measures, they, they can have very different form. And in order to better understand these complexity measures, it's nice to have some relations that allows one to relate each other. In particular, in today's talk, I'll be focusing on the complexity of learning motivated by the fact that a central goal of science is to really understand and learn how our universe operates. And hence, if we can better understand the complexity of learning, such as what kind of things we can efficiently learn and what kind of things we're just impossible to learn, it can really help us gain better intuition and insight into, into how one should do science. And furthermore, as machine learning algorithms have been progressing very rapidly in recent years, um, in order to better understand how machine learning can be used in science, having a fundamental understanding for the complexity of learning could also be very helpful in that regard. And for today's talk, I'll be focusing on the complexity of learning about quantum systems since our world is inherently quantum mechanical. And if we can better understand these complexity, it can potentially help us design better learning algorithms to say, simulate quantum systems in order to design better catalysts, um, designing better pharmaceuticals, or even designing better materials. For example, there have been these recent breakthrough from DeepMind that shows how AI models can be used to generate, synthesize a bunch of new materials. It can also help gain new insights into exotic quantum matter and also engineer better quantum devices, such as the logical quantum processor that Michelle Lukin presented yesterday. However, despite all of these applications, today I'll be focusing on something very foundational, which is um, a complexity measure of learning and how it relates to complexity of creating quantum system. So while complexity of learning is really on the rise, there have been a lot of research from a theoretical side and application side in recent years. Um, in the more traditional um, field of quantum information and say black hole physics, um, people have studied more widely this notion of complexity of creating quantum systems instead of complexity of learning quantum systems. For example, there's this well-known conjecture by Brown and Suskin, which on a very high level states that the complexity of creating quantum systems generated by random evolution of time t grows linearly in t. And here, this is essentially presenting like a correspondence between the complexity for creation and the evolution time of the quantum system. And for today's talk, what we'd like to present is this fundamental relation between the complexity of learning and creating quantum systems, which is motivated by these high level question. That is, is there some kind of correspondence between the complexity of learning them and creating them? So a priority, these two concepts are very different since they talks about very different operations, one is learning, one is creation. And it's not a priority clear that they should be related in any way. However, as I will show in today's talk, that they're deeply connected. And in a way, the complexity of learning can be seen as equivalent to the complexity of creating quantum systems. So in order to establish these correspondence, um, throughout the talk, I would first start out by presenting some formal mathematical definition that talks about these different complexity meshes. I would then present the relation between these complexity measures, present the underlying proof ideas for establishing these connections, 
and finally conclude with some future directions. So let's begin with the first part on presenting the formal definition. And let me start by talking about the complexity of creating a quantum state. So let's say we have some n-qubit state psi, then the most popular definition for the complexity of creation is known as quantum circuit complexity, which is the minimum number of elementary gates, often thought of as two qubit gates or elements in SU4, needed to create these quantum state psi from say the all zero state. More precisely, there are two notion of quantum circuit complexity. One is called exact quantum circuit complexity and second one is approximate. They're very related, but in a way they're also fundamentally quite different. So exact quantum circuit complexity is talks about the minimum number of elementary gates needed to create psi exactly. Whereas in approximate quantum circuit complexity, all we care about is in creating the state psi up to some error epsilon. Usually this error is characterized by the trace distance. And for people that are not familiar, trace distance of two object just means like if, it, if the trace distance is epsilon, it means that for all observables, the two quantum state will have um, a value that's at most epsilon away. So exact quantum circuit complexity, while much nicer and doesn't have this dependence on epsilon, it can be very fragile because whenever you have a state with certain complexity, now you perturb it by an infinitesimal amount and now this, the complexity might just change um, drastically. So that's why it's much more physically uh, motivated to talk about approximate quantum circuit complexity, but in a lot of cases also makes it much harder to prove things. So now if we go back to this conjecture that the complexity of creating quantum states generated by random evolution grows linearly, um, one can then utilize this definition to formalize this conjecture. I think originally when they proposed it, it was kind of a more fuzzy, but then using quantum circuit complexity, one can properly formalize it. And the conjecture essentially states that if we have a state generated by some random evolution of time t, then with high probability over these evolution, the circuit complexity, usually noted as the approximate circuit complexity, should grow linearly in t for an exponentially long time. So from short time, the complexity would be small. And then if you keep growing up to exponential time, the circuit complexity would also grow to an exponential value. So that's complexity of create, creation. And now I would like to define what it means to, or what are some natural complexity measures for learning. In this case, um, in order to talk about learning, we have to have some object that was unknown to us. And here we're going to consider the incubus state psi to be an unknown object. And what we would like to do is to learn what this psi is. However, in order to make it more meaningful, we, have, we would consider the state psi to come from some class C. One can think of C as, for example, all kinds of state that could be generated by quantum evolution of time up to T, for example. And this class C essentially encodes the existing knowledge of the unknown quantum state. So now, given this unknown incubus state psi, a popular notion of complexity for learning is called sample complexity, which has been widely studied in quantum state tomography, in quantum information theory, in machine learning theory. The sample complexity is essentially the minimum number of measurements required to learn the state psi up to a small error epsilon. So note that this, in terms of learning, it doesn't really quite make sense to talk about the exact case, because if we wanted to learn something up to zero error, typically that would require infinite number of measurements due to the statistical fluctuation. So always people talk about simple complexity up to some error epsilon. Another important concept um, or complexity measure for characterizing learning is called computational complexity, which instead of talking just about the number of measurements required to learn things, we also talk about the computational time required to learn it. The definition is just the minimum number of computational time or minimum computational time needed to learn this unknown quantum system up to a small error. So these two complexity, they're definitely related, but they can also be very different. So a very basic relation is that the computational complexity always upper bounds the sample complexity since just doing measurement and recording the measurement outcome would already take time. However, computational complexity could potentially be much higher than sample complexity for learning. 
So together, we now have the proper mathematical definition to talk about the high-level question that I stated earlier. And the formal way to pose it is given as follows. Suppose we are given some unknown n qubit say psi with a circuit complexity of C. That means in order to create it, we need at least C number of gates. Then one could ask, what is the complexity for learning these kind of states? Is there a relation between the complexity for learning and their intrinsic circuit complexity? So since I think all the definitions are pretty straightforward, um, I hope that the audience could start to think about, based on your intuition, what the answer to this problem should be. Yeah. Yeah, we're assuming, assuming like there's some physical source that generates uh, some some copies of the states, and every time we just measure. So, so there are several possible answer. For example, because when we have a state of circuit complexity C, there's exponentially see different possibility for these states. So when there's exponentially different possibility one might assume that maybe the complexity for learning them have to be exponential in the circuit complexity. So that's one reasonable bet on the answer. Another reasonable answer is that maybe there are something magical that one could do. Perhaps machine learning algorithms are very powerful so they can learn very, very efficiently. And instead of having a complexity that scales exponentially in circuit complexity, we just maybe need only linear time and linear number of measurements in order to learn the unknown quantum system. That's also a possibility. Or maybe the problem is much more nuanced so that there's actually phase transition in the complexity of learning. Maybe there's a certain critical circuit complexity C0 such that below it, it's very easy and everything grows linearly, but above it, it grows exponentially. So, yeah, one, one could use uh, some of their own experience and try, try to guess which of the answer could potentially be. And yeah, essentially, I'm just going to say the answer right now. Um, so one can essentially prove the following, which is that for the entire range of complexity measure, the circuit complexity, note that circuit complexity goes from, say, 1 to 2 to the n. The maximum value is just 2 to the n. One can prove that for the entire range of complexity measure, the sample complexity always grows linearly um, with the circuit complexity. On the other hand, the physical picture changes drastically when we focus on the computational complexity. And one can show that assuming cryptographic hardness of certain um, problem, in particular here, we're using a problem known as ring LWE, so ring version of learning with error, one can prove that the computational complexity has to grow exponentially in the circuit complexity. So while the sample complexity is linear, the computational complexity grows much, much faster and eventually saturate very quickly. So that's just dive in a little bit more on these relation. So regarding the relation between sample complexity of learning and the circuit complexity for creating states, um, here one can see that if we consider complexity of learning measure in terms only based on the number of measurements that we need, then it would only it would scale linearly in the complexity of creation, which both means that a linear number of measurements is already sufficient to learn an unknown state with circuit complexity C. So if you assume the brown siskin conjecture that when we have a quantum evolution of time t, it would create a state with circuit complexity t, then the number of measurements that we need to learn them would also just grow as t, linear. At the same time, it also means that at least a linear number of measurement is needed to learn an unknown state with circuit complexity c. So for people that are not familiar with this big theta notation, it just means a combination of both big O and big omega. And another way to say this is just that there exists a constant um, such that s e, s epsilon, is upper bounded by c and also lower bounded by C times a different constant. So in terms of this implication, it also means that suppose we have a quantum system that has been evolving for say a billion years. And now if we wanted to learn it, 
then the number of measurements would also have to scale um, as like a billion years. So we cannot do much better. Um, it's not sublinear. It's, a, it's also not logarithmic in the circuit complexity. It's just equal to the circuit complexity. On the other hand, the picture changes when we focus on measuring complexity of learning in terms of the computational time. So while, for example, complexity is just linear, here it grows exponentially. In particular, one can prove that there exists some very weird states with only a tiny bit of circuit complexity. Basically, the circuit complexity is just like polylogon, meaning that the state, which is an incubus state, only is generated by only placing polylogarithmic number of gates. So, so most of the gates are not even being acted on. We're just placing it on a few of them. And now we can create states that are super polynomially hard to learn. It's kind of strange. Um, and another implication is that as the computational complexity grows very quickly with circuit complexity, it also saturates very quickly. So at around circuit complexity of linear and system size, then one would already saturate the maximum computational time, which is exponential in system size, and it would just uh, flatten out. It would just plateau from there. So it gives this picture where as evolution time grows, circuit complexity grows linearly, sample complexity grows linearly, but then computational time just shoots up and then it hits the maximum value at a very, very short time, roughly linear in system size. So now what I'd like to do is to talk about how we prove these fundamental relationship between the complexity of learning and the complexity of creating quantum systems. So let's first focus on this relation between the sample complexity of learning and the circuit complexity for creating states. So in order to prove this, we have to consider two parts. First, we have to show that there exists one protocol, a very clever de design protocol, such that at most a linear number of measurement is sufficient to learn the unknown state. At the same time, we also need to prove the lower bound, which says that at least a linear number of measurement is necessary to learn. And both of these, we're going to utilize different kind of physical concept. The first one, we're going to use scrambling in order to create a clever learning procedure. And the second one, we're going to go back to these brown skin conjecture to prove that there's no faster way to learn better. So for this first part, on showing that there's a good learning algorithm to efficiently learn. The procedure is pretty straightforward. So we would take this unknown quantum system, we would just scramble it using um, some random dynamics, and then at the end, just measure out everything in the Z basis. We do that for a few times, essentially linear in the circuit complexity of the underlying state. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look closely at the measurement data and try to use the measurement data to figure out what the unknown state actually is. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the space of states with circuit complexity C. This is a weird looking space because it doesn't really form a group. Like if we have, take some element in this space, um, which is a state, and we apply a quantum gate onto it, it might actually decrease the circuit complexity or increase the circuit complexity, which makes it go outside of this space. So I'm just visually drawing the space at this cloud shape thing. What we're trying to, what we are doing now is we're going to cover this space of states with a covering net, which are just a bunch of representative points such that for each of these points, if we blow up a small epsilon ball around them, the union of these balls will cover this entire space. We can show that the number of representatives needed to cover it grows like exponentially in C. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run a tournament over all of these representative points. So the tournament essentially does the following. The intuition is that because this is a covering net, the unknown state, which lives in this space, will be close to at least one of these representative points. And hence, what we need to do is to figure out what is the closest representative points. And to do that, we're going to run these kind of battle between every pair of representative points using the measurement data that we obtain. So for example, we can take any two representative points and ask which one is more likely to generate the measurement data that we seek. And yeah, and we'll pick the one to be the winner 
um, if it's more likely to generate the measurement data. We're going to do this battle over all pairs of representative points. And at the end, we will, give, we will claim the winner to be the one that wins the most battles for, between them. However, there's an important criteria that we need to make sure, which is that these battles are fair in the sense that if one represented point is actually closer to the unknown state, it should win over the other one. However, in order to guarantee that, it's not quite simple. Because, for example, if we have two representative points, and in order to distinguish whether which one is closer, we have to measure in a certain basis. Um, and for that basis, it might be, yeah, and when we measure in that basis, we would get some information about this battle. But then there's exponentially many other battles that we need to also get. So intuitively, from this tournament picture, it seems like the number of measurements has to grow exponentially in C, because there's an exponential number of battles that we try to accurately um, or fairly compete them. However, what one can essentially prove is that when we choose these scrambling dynamics to be sufficiently scrambling, characterized by the three design nature of the unitary, so let's say the scrambling dynamics is some chaotic evolution under some random time, or let's say it's, for example, like a, just a random circuit, or it's a random unitary element or, or random Clifford elements, then one can show that for these scrambling dynamics, the number of battles that we can fairly conduct will grow exponentially in the number of measurements. So every time we do one more measurement, somehow the information compounds very nicely and it allows one to conduct twice as many battles. And hence, it can grow very rapidly. And yeah, so now we see that the number of battles that we need to conduct scales exponentially in the circuit complexity. The number of measurements also, uh, and also it scales exponentially in the number of measurements. And together, if we do a number of measurements that is upper bounded by C, we will be able to run the battle, run the tournament accurately, and determine the correct winner in order to learn the state. And that allows one to essentially prove the statement that at least C over epsilon squared number of measurement is sufficient to learn the unknown state. Now we also need to prove that this number of measurement is necessary to learn the unknown object. And the way we do that is to resort back to this concept of from Brown and Susskind, which states that the complexity of creating quantum systems generated by random evolutions of time t grows linearly in t. And what that one way to think about that is every time when time progresses, we're applying more gates to the system. And when we apply more gates to the system, the complexity, the underlying complexity actually grows, meaning that we cannot compress the complexity in these quantum systems. Um, and hence, another way to think about it is that every time we apply an additional random gate, the the number of states that we can generate would just grow with it. And in order to formally characterize these ideas, we can show that when we look at the space of states again, but now instead of covering it, we wanted to do, we want to pack it. So we wanted to find as many representative points as possible, such that all of them are sufficiently far apart from one another. One can show that from the intuition from Brown and Susskind conjecture that we can pack exponential and see many representative in this space. So while that's a conjecture, um, this formal statement for the packing net size can be rigorously proven um, using some, some mathematical techniques. Um, and yeah, and basically after creating these packing net, um, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize this packing net to create a communication, essentially like a communication protocol between Alice and Bob, where Bob is going to run the learning algorithm in order to learn about the state. So the idea is the following. So Alice will have some classical information that it, she tried to convey to Bob. And what she's going to do is she's going to essentially encode that classical information in one of the points in this packing net. So now the packing net just corresponds to some state of complexity C, which will be sent to Bob. Bob will then do these measurements in order to extract the information or in order to learn the state. So now after the Bob has learned the state, it will be able to determine 
which, is, which representative points was chosen by Alice. And hence, she, Bob can now decode the classic information that was embedded in the quantum system from Alice. And now with these communication protocol, one can then perform an information theoretic analysis to show that the sample complexity, that is the number of measurements required by Bob, can be lower bounded by the mutual information between Alice and Bob. And because they can convey an, an essentially one among exponential and C different points to one another, it means that they will be able to transmit C amount of bits, and hence mutual information is lower bounded by C, and together it shows that the sample complexity was also lower bounded by C. So together, one can establish this linear growth of sample complexity for learning quantum systems with respect to the underlying intrinsic circuit complexity. On the other hand, for the computational complexity, um, the proof goes pretty similarly. We also have to have two parts, presenting an upper bound, presenting a lower bound. For the upper bound, it's very simple. You just look at the tournament that I talked about previously, and we see that how many battles are there. There's exponential and C number of battles, and hence the computational time can be easily upper bounded by two to the C. However, there is a minimum between C and N here. Essentially, the idea is that if the circuit complexity is too high, much higher than N, then what we should do is we should just run a standard quantum state tomography and it will have a two to the N scaling. The more non-trivial part is in establishing that an exponential time is actually needed in order to learn an unknown system. And the way we construct that is by utilizing essentially these ring LWE problem, which can then be used to create one-way function. And we can use the one-way function to create these pseudo-random state. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to play with that pseudo-random state um, in order to create these like hard to learn state with tiny bit of circuit complexity. So the circuit complexity is very, very low. It only has like polylogarithmic in N gates, for example. Um, so it means that there is some tiny circuit with very few gates applied onto only a few qubits. And then that seemingly very simple state can already be, be super polynomially hard to learn. And that all kind of come from the ring LWE hardness. And together that, again, showcases these um, results that says the computational complexity T epsilon will have to grow exponentially in the circuit complexity and it would plateau very quickly when the circuit complexity reaches system size, or one can think of it as the evolution time reaches system size. So now with these proof ideas and these fundamental relation, one can, I would like to conclude. Um, so from this Brown's skin conjecture, we see that nature can create states with circuit complexity C in time less linear in C. At least we believe so for fast scramblers such as black holes. So in a way, it produces this correspondence between evolution time and also the circuit complexity. Of course, in that paper, they, they also link the evolution time to say um, the volume, um, this complexity equal to volume um, conjecture. And here, what we did is we consider these two different notions of complexity. So instead of talking about the complexity for creation, we consider the complexity for learning about things. In a way, they're dual to one another, um, because as we can see, the sample complexity for learning these states scales linearly in the circuit complexity, which is then linear to the evolution time. However, if we change this to a different complexity measure based on computational time, then we see that the, the picture changes drastically. However, at the same time, if you just take log of the computational time, we see that it would also have a linear growth in circuit complexity. However, when the time goes on, um, the circuit, the sample complexity will grow linearly for an exponential time. Um, the computational complexity will quickly grow. And then at around system size time, it would just saturate. And then it would just plateau at the same exponential value. So that essentially provides the connection between circuit complexity, sample complexity, and computational complexity. 
now going forward, um, in particular, if one is interested about all these different complexity measure and wanted to better understand how, say, scrambling, scrambling dynamics actually come into play, um, feel free to check out this list of paper. The first paper, predicting many properties of a quantum system, provides this formalism for talking about how scrambling dynamics can be used for efficient learning. In the second paper, we essentially presented this link between circuit complexity and sample complexity. And finally, in the last paper that was put out a few weeks ago, we established these precise characterization that the sample complexity is essentially equal to the circuit complexity. And on the other hand, the computational complexity, um, if we take a log of it, is equal to the circuit complexity up to system size. Now going forward, there's a lot of, again, very fundamental questions that remain to be answered. Um, in particular, in order to prove this exponential growth of computational complexity, we constructed some very special and highly contrived states where its circuit complexity is very, very small, but somehow it's super hard to learn. And one natural question is that, are these kind of exponential growth of computational complexity prevalent in nature? Are there actual physical systems where the, the computational complexity also grows exponentially in time? Perhaps maybe a fast scrambler like black holes are an example of that, but, or maybe um, condensed matter systems are also like that. So right now it's not clear what the answer to that is. Or maybe there's a divide, maybe some condensed matter um, systems are actually has like a polynomial growth of computational complexity, but a fast scramblers actually has an exponential growth. To note that these small circuits I talk about are also fast scrambling circuit. And another interesting question is, how does this fundamental concept for the complexity of learning relate to other physical concepts such as geometry or the entanglement, amount of entanglement in the system? Does that provide a hardness to learning or, or not? Or another question that people have been exploring more recently is how does phase transition and learning place a, um, connects to one another? In particular, maybe at the critical point for some phase transition, the complexity of learning also blows up um, completely. At least in some of the early or more preliminary theoretical analysis, we did see that a spectral gap closes. That is, as we approach um, the critical point, a lot of the computational and sample complexity just blows up exponentially. And or, or also maybe it's related to many body localization, et cetera. And with that, I would like to conclude this talk. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, can you explain again what are these representatives like technically in your algorithm and specifically how, how do you know the epsilon ball of those representatives will cover the whole space? Uh -huh. Yeah, so in a way, this uh, space of, let me go to the right. So in this space of states with a given circuit complexity, I mean, in a way, we, we construct these representative points. Each of these points correspond to some quantum system. And what the, the epsilon ball is just, um, is measured in terms of trace distance. So we take all of these different quantum system, we just blow up a small ball around it. And then the claim is that it will cover it. So it is not very, it's, it is non-trivial to prove that the, we can find such a class of representative points such that it covers it, but but, but there are techniques for doing that. So I'll just say it exactly. The uh, packing net, uh, is this in some sense already proving uh, to a uh, scene conjecture probabilistically so that you randomly draw a state from the net with high probability actually has the complexity that's given there? Yeah, that's a good point. So in a way, I would say that uh, this, this the result that we had addressed so this, there's no tautology. So I'm just saying that more like intuitively these, if, if we assume this conjecture, then we will be able to see that the number of representative points should grow exponentially in C. Um, and here, this we can rigorously prove. Um, but so as of now, 
the brown skin conjecture remains open. Um, I mean, it is proven for exact quantum circuit complexity, but for the more physically relevant um, complexity, it has not been proven yet. Um, <laughs> in a way, it does, it does resolve some form. Like, if one define, because there's a different way to formalize this since this, this is like just stated in a very high level. So in a way, it does show that we can create random evolutions of time t such that the resulting quantum systems um, generically will have a complexity that grows linear in t. However, when, when people are thinking about it, people are thinking about it in terms of like each gate being randomly drawn from the same distribution. But here, what we're going to, what we will show is more like there's a way to draw the whole, whole gates together from some distribution such that the conjecture can be proven. So, so there are some subtle dis differences. Um, and that's why this remains a conjecture. Used by the, uh, the proof of the first part, when you, with your, your protocol, which says you take a uh, copy of your, you take one of the copies of your unknown state, you scramble it in the scrambling dynamics, and then you measure it in the Z basis, for example. Yeah. Uh, if the dynamics are scrambling, won't, won't this look like just completely gobbledygook to measurement? Will this yeah. be completely random measurement? So it would be very hard, you know, for pretty much any state. Right? Yeah, so typically that's, that's, um, that's one, what one would expect. Um, but actually, because the scrambling dynamics is a unitary dynamics, there's going to be structures that are still maintained within it. So at the end, the measurement is going to look very spread out and kind of look like uniform distribution. But if one actually looked closely into it, it would actually have this notion called the speckle patterns that was often seen in like quantum supremacy experiments, as well as these IQP sampling experiments that Misha showed yesterday. Um, Basically, the distribution, despite it looking very flat out, there are still going to be patterns in it. So certain bit strings will have a much lower probability from occurring compared to some other bit strings, even though they're anti-concentrated and very spread out. And that's kind of the, the place where signals can get extracted. And it allows one to simultaneously predict a bunch of incompatible observables from, from it. Dynamics as a low depth circuit, is that? No, this is a... Uh, one can think of the scrambling dynamics to be any, it, it has to be a high depth circuit. It cannot be a low depth circuit. Um, and it can be anything that forms three design or higher. So it can really be a exponentially deep quantum circuit and this procedure will still work. Um, it could also be like a linear depth quantum circuit and it would also work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can also be hard. And the pseudo random? Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure if pseudorandom will work. My suspicion is it will not, um, because despite pseudorandom being indistinguishable from a computational perspective from hard random, here we're talking about more like sample complexity instead of computational ones. So, so it, it, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure um, about that. Yeah, because the, the measurement mm -hmm. is simulated in the first measure from very high complexity in the numerator. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it would make sense that you might be able to distinguish from pseudo-random and random? Uh, hmm. Yeah, because here we're not talking about computational complexity, so it could do that. Yes. Uh, sorry, in the duration of the scaling, uh, do we have a locality for quantum system? In other words, do we allow like arbitrary to qubit gates or only those that came on qubits which are somehow close to the Euclidean space? Uh -huh. You mean like in the very early on, when I talk about the definition for quantum circuit complexity, does it consider long range interactions or some geometric locality? Yes, yeah, so, so at least defined here, it considers uh, any arbitrary two qubit gates. There's no. Like in this space, uh, space dimension, is there any modification of the scaling to the states, uh, main body systems? I see. You mean like, what if. Um, yeah, actually, that's kind of related to one of the question, which is how does geometry come into play? So right now, all of the things that I talked about, it, there's no geometry involved. It's also a connection between every, every qubit. So now one could immediately ask, what if it's in 1D or 2D system? Then how does the, all these relation changes? To be honest, I, I'm not sure. So that's why it's an open question. I, I do feel like a lot of the results are going to be similar. For example, the sample complexity scaling, um, the, the up, at least the upper bound part, 
which says that at most order C over epsilon square measurement is sufficient, that would hold because that only restrict, like geometry only restrict the space of states. So that would hold. Um, but then the lower bound, I think it would also hold because I think the construction that we made to create to, to do things, it, it, it's kind of geometrically local, even in 1D. So, so yeah, so I think at least the, this correspondence between sample complexity and strict complexity um, would, would just directly hold. But some of the other things, for example, the computational complexity part, I'm not sure. Is it easy to see why a two design isn't sufficiently scrambling? Hmm. That's a good question. So I would say, at least my intuition is that if, if it's only two design, then, then, then there's not enough constant, like, um, because there's an important thing, which is like when we're doing this kind of battle um, between every representative points, we want things to somehow concentrate. And in order to have it concentrate, we need the third moment because the third moment in a way characterizes like the variance of the deviation. But if the third moment is not bounded, only the second moment is bounded, it only says that the battle in acceptation can be done correctly, but it doesn't talk about how many measurement is needed in order for the battle to give the correct outcome. So, so as of now, I'm not sure if two design will be sufficient. At least the proof seems to rely heavily on three design. The third moments can be small. Sorry. The third moment can be small, even if you don't have three design. That's true. I mean, more like as, as long as third moment is small, then, then, then it's good. It doesn't really have to be exact three design. Thanks. Questions? Thank you. Um, so I was actually, right. So here you were talking about, um, for instance, like learning with respect to a circuit class C. And I was actually wondering um, in terms of computational complexity, what's kind of like the best or like the most general classes of um, circuit C for which we actually have polynomial time algorithms to learn? It? There's a few examples. Um, one of the example that there's a paper out there is um, when we have Clifford circuit spurs with T gates. And as long as the T gate is less than log n, then it will be efficient. And essentially using the techniques here, one can prove that if it's beyond log n T gates, then it becomes computationally hard. So, so the transition point is really at logarithmic log n like T gates. So that's one of the class that people know it can be learned efficiently. Um, we also have a result that hopefully will be out soon that shows that any shallow quantum circuit can be learned efficiently. So I think that constitutes another different class because shallow quantum circuit can in principle have like linear number of T gates. Um, so, so in a way it kind of, it, they're just different classes. But these are two main classes that I know of. I'm wondering if people have considered um, a class of circuits that maybe corresponds to, you know, like a physical, but so I guess like particular physical classes of systems, like, oh, okay. like you know, like cable or something, or like non, like non chaotic systems or something like uh, that. Yeah, so actually, we also had a, another result which says that any um, local Hamiltonian can be learned very efficiently. So if we have a unitary generated by short time Hamiltonian dynamics, we can also learn that efficiently. So it doesn't have to. It can be chaotic, it can be integrable, and all of that can be learned efficiently. Yeah. Right. Okay.